New moment. You ready? Boom, Shanka. New moment. I don't know why my thing is so dark here. Oh, there we go. Let's just sit on an angle. What's happening, Doug? You look like you're in bed. Are you, is it late there? No, I just have a sheet against a chair. Oh. <laughs> Got to get comfortable. Heidi. How you doing? Vivian. Anna. Tina. <sighs> How are you doing? Oh, well. <laughs> as well as can be expected. I'm still laughing. So. But uh, new moment. New moment, new moment. The, uh, the temptation to buy into the, the illusion is uh, pretty sticky sometimes. You know, there's a lot of um, loading on some of the emotional associations that I have and uh, Sometimes they just pop up and the rug gets pulled out from under your feet and you're back to square one again. And it's like, thank God for that. You're always at the beginning. So I'm at the beginning. <laughs> new, new moment, born again, every moment. I read a beautiful article once by this um, physicist, a uh, uh, um, a quantum, I don't recall his name, quantum physicist who uh, was investigating the nature of quarks, which are like at that time, quarks were the smallest um, visible through a microscope kind of, or whatever, you know, through a measuring device, atomic kind of particle that we were aware of. This is going back 20 odd years and now we've got Higgs boson and everything, but uh, I think it was the quark pops in and out of, uh, awareness or in and out of reality all the time and they didn't know where it disappears to like it just appears and then disappears appears and then it disappears and that's exactly the same thing because that's what mind is mind is appearing and reappearing and reappearing on the dreamscape again and again and again in the illusion of temporal order and uh, as soon as I try to locate myself in a fixed position in time and space as a, as a linear sequential being, you know, going from one place to another place, I'm automatically screwed because that's no longer the truth, even here in, in uh, time and space. So it's nice to have uh, a moment. And I had, uh, I got a phone call yesterday um, from another dear one that I know who uh, saw a post I put out, put up and we had a really nice moment um, and went through a whole bunch of stuff right at the basics, which is just like, man, it's sticky. You know, it's sticky. That that first step into hell is a slippery slope. And you put your foot on it and whoop, down you go. And <laughs> if it wasn't for your brothers, you'd be there for a long, long time. So, but, uh, so anyway, I thought I'd talk about today. Um Apart from applying the lessons, which we never get to, we never get to um, finishing the twenty-minute book, Tina. Like maybe you guys should start it like earlier. Oh no, we can't. <laughs> oh. Because you go until you know it's already four hours. <laughs> um, okay. But we do. We have. There's an opportunity, and I just want to say it now um, to do the all fifty because we do all fifty on Thursday yesterday. Which so, is my Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, no, which is your, my Thursday is your Friday. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm happy to add another day for that opportunity because I'm. Um, you, you, know. you do whatever you want. Okay, okay. Cause we <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you're in a directed to do, you do it. You don't All have right. to get anyone's approval for it. It's like, I'm just saying. Jesus, Jesus will just be doing this. I mean, I Two can do thumbs. it alone. I don't, but Whatever you want to do. Two thumbs up. Yay. So um, I wanted to talk about projection. Um, 
in this one because that's what's been coming up, projection, 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 and trying to offset or offlay the guilt out into the dream onto someone, something, whatever. And that is the natural action of the temporal mind. That is the automatic action of the temporal mind. It doesn't matter how long you've been um, pursuing a spiritual discipline or whatever. You can never really um, lose sight of that. And uh, I remember Ted used to say, never underestimate the power of your ego. Whilst you find yourself here in the world, um, the necessity for, for constant vigilance is like it's just, it doesn't let up. And uh, just to use the thing I've been through this week as an example, the idea of buying into something it's like, you know, those little things you shoot flies with? Do you have them in America with the, the little gun and they have this sticky thing on the end? We have a lot of flies in Australia. So in the in the novelty shops and the news agents and places like that, you can buy these little tiny rubber band pistols. And they have like a, a flat disc on the end that you can put this sticky stuff on. And it's really for kids. And you shoot flies and the flies stick to it, right? It's like... Kids love doing it. And uh, the fly, once the fly's on this thing, it's it's stuck there. You can't get it off, right? It takes a lot of effort to get it off. And like at the end of the day, the kids shoot a few flies and the end of the thing looks disgusting. So it's kind of, <laughs> that's like transformation. You get a thought and it gets stuck in your head. Right? It's the same thing. You get a thought stuck in your head and uh, it doesn't matter who brings it up, how it comes up, what it's about, nothing. You'll find that you have an association with it, like that sticky thing. And it's like there's an emotional reaction, right? And you'll know the reaction because you'll want to defend yourself. Someone will say something and you'll want to defend your immediate sort of um, um, hallmark of denial, right? You wouldn't defend yourself against anything if you didn't... Uh, didn't believe that you weren't guilty of something. All right. So, but you never know where these things are hidden. You never know where these like points in your mind, these little catalysts or triggers are. And uh, it's usually with family and friends and people that are closest to you that you've had more of a relationship with that these things tend to uh, lay in wait for you. And, uh, learning to remember that um, not only not to project outward onto the, onto the figures in the dream, but also learning not to um, take what's projected onto you um, as if it were a reality. Right? You take it from a point of view of being responsible for it, whatever's spoken, whatever's said, because if you react to it, it's only you that's given it that meaning. And it's all the meaning in falsity that we're trying to expose and uh, confront and release through forgiveness. But to take it on board as if it were status quo, as if it were actually a truth, will lead you into a very dark place. And uh, it's like, all right, I see that I went into a very dark place there with that idea because I let the figures in the dream tell me what was going on rather than God. And boom, the veil drops again. So all of a sudden, I'm happy, happy, happy. Someone says something, comes out of left field, and then the next thing you know, you go to defend yourself, and then boom, the veil drops. And it takes a minute. It takes like your mighty companions to step in and to remind you and to help you and to go with it to go through it with you and everything, which is like these Zoom meetings, to be able to find a moment of grace, to be able to find that moment where you can just be still and breathe and offer it to the Holy Spirit. That's all there is to do with it. Attempting to analyze it, which is uh, what I did. It's like doing this one, <laughs> but, 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 but. Uh, attempting to analyze it is futile. There's no analysis of it because it doesn't actually exist. It's just an illusion, just a dream. Right? 
trying to work out your own salvation is simply working out how it is that you're um, applying forgiveness to those things that show up, not working out the machinations of what those things represent to you symbolically. Because symbolically, there's one problem, one solution. They all represent denial. Right? So to judge it and to try to work it out doubly um, adds to the mistake. You see that? So it's like I'm accepting in a judgment, forgetting that I'm responsible for it, defending myself against it, and then looking for the reasons why I want to defend myself against it which is the action of the mind. So I've made one mistake and now I make another mistake. So now I need two miracles. <laughs> Rather than just to accept it in and go, hang on a minute, whatever this person's saying, whatever, you know, it's like I'm responsible for this. I can heal it at this level. I won't defend myself. I'll let them say whatever they want to say. And then I'll accept atonement for myself. For myself. I'll accept at one month for myself in that situation and allow it to be healed miraculously by the Holy Spirit rather than getting my knickers in a twist and going down further into the rabbit hole that wasn't necessary. And uh, it's the same error made twice. The opportunity to release that error could have happened on the first mistake. I didn't have to make a mistake and then a mistake about my mistake. So it was like... Um, a moment of grace was missed and it took to get further down into it to actually realize that I'd missed it. So it's a good thing. <laughs> the lesson repeats until it's learned and it's like there's nothing because everything is by the will of God. There's nothing that isn't helpful. So seeing what I did in my own mind, right, as the making the mistake and then making a mistake about my mistake, um, is helpful in learning to watch for that again. It's the same as when you're just watching for a normal trigger in a cycle that comes around, comes around, comes around. And so I've logged it in with Jesus to be extra vigilant for this particular cycle if it comes around again. And I want to see where I'm at with it and see how honest I was with the healing of it. So I feel pretty good now, but then I would have said that before I made the mistake. I feel pretty good now. Nothing can possibly upset me today. I feel so great. I'm walking with God and then boom. What a liar I am. <laughs> so I'm always, I'm always telling lies. I'm always, I'm always uh, my own worst enemy and all of these sorts of things. So, But uh, it's good to have the rug pulled out from under your feet now and again. And I remember, um, I think I was talking to somebody about this. I remember about two years into doing the course, I could have told anyone any of the concepts and explained any of the principles and the whole thing and then one morning I woke up and the whole thing was gone just overnight the whole thing was erased from my mind it's like I can't explain anything to anyone right? primarily there's no one to explain anything to because everything that I'm talking about is just a declaration it's like you guys are my witness I'm here waking up as an idea of one mind waking up and you guys are bearing witness to that Right? Each of us in our own capacity at accepting atonement for ourselves. It's tricky, but that's where you have uh, the holy instant. You know, you have those moments where you step back and you ask for the experience, and the experience shows you the truth of the singular nature of your expression. So, but uh, the ego is just as powerful in denial as the Christ mind is in its love for the Father. Uh, the ego is just as powerful because you're using the power of God mind creating to manifest the idea of what the ego represents. Right? It's the same power. So uh, being a bit, um, what do you call it when you sort of let yourself off the hook? When you, when you give up, when you, you're not, not playing your best game. Oh, there's a word for it anyway, but uh, Heidi's got Sounds it. like grace. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. No, I was thinking it's like a baseball term or something when you uh, can't remember. Anyway, but not holding yourself accountable to the highest point of integrity you're aware of, you know, 
just because, and in this case, just because you think the other person is on the same page with you. Right? So it's like, oh, I think that if I say something, this person is going to understand what I'm saying because we're all in this together. And it's like, man, it takes a lot to hear this. It takes a lot to hear this. And like, for me, especially having just gone through it for this week or as an idea of this week, it took a lot to hear it. It was like, it was one of those right back at the beginning kind of things. And it's like, I'm grateful. So whoo, that was hardcore. Haven't had one of those for like in the idea of time for many, many years, but uh, it was a doozy. <laughs> doozy. So, so hearing, hearing and listening are two things that have been coming up and it's like you teach what you need to learn. So teaching, listening, teaching, hearing is something that I want to be about um, in the idea of stepping back, in the idea of um, taking second place to gain the first. Right? Jesus talks in the course about you take, you take the second place to gain the first. Right, The first place is um or the first place for any temporal association is um to discover oneself as god's kingdom right you are the children of god therefore you are his kingdom it's not some place with cosmic buildings and stuff like that it's you right it's me so when i step back from to take the second place i gain the first because that's the highest thing that's what god values the most Okay, God values me the most as in his son, as in Christ, as in that, that mind that he created. Therefore, I am the first. The idea that I think I could usurp God and be the creator, I would actually take, in a sense, second place to try and do that, to try and assume that. It's like if God sees if God sees me as the most valuable thing, why would I not simply accept that? It's like it's hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to imagine that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything like that and all the multiverses and the whole thing and everything um, would have something of value other, you know, like something of, in me that's his greatest value. I don't even know how to talk about it. So it's like the expression of God being the expression of God or the extension of his creative will. That is what's important. That is what's the most valuable thing in all of eternity. Right? That's what the Christ is. And I have on my back, I have a poem tattooed by Hafiz and uh, I, I forget it now. I can't, I, I, 360 degree head but i have a, a poem by hafiz about uh, it's called the tree house and it talks about there is a hidden jewel sewn in a in a, a field that you own the title to it's like you've hidden it in a place that you know that you own and it's like you'll dig it up one day you'll i wish i could i was looking for my hafiz book the other day and i couldn't find it oh look heidi's got a hafiz book it's in the gift you know the little book the gift Oh, that's it. You're clever. You're right onto it. I think it's called Treehouse or In a Treehouse. And it's like it perfectly sums up the idea of self-discovery. It perfectly sums up and in a beautiful way. Um, the innocence of the perspective of self when seen from that second place. I choose the second place. But if I'm trying to usurp the throne of God, I'm trying to assume first place. I'm trying to give my ego autonomy and uh, I can't hear anything. Okay? I can't hear anything. So learning, learning what it is then that second place is as a, as a divine place is kind of important because you never realize how it is that the ego suddenly sneaks back in and the next thing you know, you're buying into illusions again. 
right? Which means I'm trying to overthrow God again. Right? Buying into the illusion isn't so I can make myself a victim of it, isn't so I can feel a victim of it. It's so I can verify the temporal identity and maintain the hidden agenda of the ego, which is to usurp God. Mm. Get it? The, the dream is just what appears on the surface. It's the underlying motive. So I react to something in a dream. I buy into it. I give it a meaning. I validate it. I defend myself against it. And then I look for the reasons why I defended it as if they weren't already apparent to me as, uh, as if they were something else other than trying to overthrow God. You know, so that I can play out this game of who's right and who's wrong in the dream and keep it up here on a surface level, verifying the ego autonomy rather than stepping back and allowing that healing to occur. Right. You look confused there, Tim. Am I, no, am I sharing my screen? Because it says I am. I wasn't trying yeah, to. Yeah, you are. Am I? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't mean to. I did that earlier. Go today. for it, Heidi. Read the poem. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I think it's better to... I found it, I think. Yeah, yeah. You, find it. you look it up online. Is it in a, a treehouse? Tree yeah, I found it. All right, so, let's read it out. All right, well, you know, let's share the screen. I didn't mean to do that, but... No, you, you can just read it out. It. Okay, all right. I'll you got it? Go for it, Heidi. It? I want to hear cool. you if you got it. Right on. <laughs> well, it's not sharing. No, just read it out. I don't have it. Oh, you don't have it. I thought you did. All right, so let me share so you can read it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe we can send it. Oh, there we go. Started screen sharing. I just got this. Just got this there thing. we go. Okay. All right, Heidi. Can you read it? Uh, oh. Read it, Heidi. <laughs> All right. Okay. Nope. Oh, it went away. Gone again. No, here it is. Oh, is it? Okay. No worries. Light will someday split you open. Mm -hmm. oh, there you, go. you got it? Yes. Yeah. I only got the first top of it. I'll, I'll scroll for you. Okay. <clears throat> Light will someday split you open, even if your life now is now a cage. For a divine seed, the crown of destiny is hidden. Whoa, don't keep moving. <laughs> For the divine seed, the crown of destiny is hidden and sown on an ancient fertile plain that you hold the title to. Love will surely bust you wide open into an unfettered, blooming new galaxy. A life-giving radiance will come. Oh, look again, yourself. For I know you once the elegant host. You knew I know you were once the elegant host to all the marvels in creation. From a sacred crevice in your body, a bow rises each night and shoots your soul to God. Behold the beautiful one from the vantage point of love. He is conducting the affairs of the whole universe in a tree house on a limb in your heart. Hmm. <laughs> <sighs> That's such a beautiful poem, man. That, that poem is... Can you imagine the mind that wrote that poem? Mm. Like that's a total, there's a total comprehension that there's nothing to worry about in that poem. God's in your heart, in a treehouse, conducting the affairs of the whole universe like this. You know, the whole, the whole ability, the whole, oh man. The whole key to unlocking that in your mind is buried on an ancient fertile plain that you hold the title to. You hold the title to it. It's like you own it. You already own it. It's buried within you on an ancient fertile plain. 
We're going to dig it up. We're digging it up and we're claiming it. I already own this. I'm going to dig it up and I'm going to claim it. <clears throat> so, whoo. So hearing, hearing requires listening. There's many levels or several levels to listening. In the physical sense, listening to a brother is listening between the words. And I, I listened to a radio show actually this week about... Um, it was a scientific one and they had a, a, um, a musician in who was talking about sound and he was saying that you don't actually hear sounds, you hear the absence of sound in between the notes of a song and the notes that are played are the interruption to the silence. Right? So what you're actually hearing is interrupted silence and the silence the segments of silence make the song, but the notes give you like this whole um, thing that you pay attention to. And it's like the, it's like a, like a conundrum in the mind at a certain level. You only hear the song because of the gaps in the notes. You only hear the song because of the spaces, you know? Oh, it was Alan Watts. I was listening to Alan Watts and, uh, if you don't, if you haven't got onto Alan Watts yet, have a listen to Alan Watts's stuff on YouTube. It's just beautiful, very English. Um, but the idea of the idea of being, the idea of being in that place, in that silence, is what we're attempting to carry with us throughout the day. It's like the idea of the music and the idea of song and the idea of dancing and everything isn't to get to the end of it. You know, it's like when you're listening to somebody's story, the idea that I'm listening to someone isn't so that I can listen until I get to the end. I'm listening for what they're saying behind the words, what those words are representing. So if I'm listening to them, just out of like a courtesy so they can get to the end of their thing so I can say what I want to say, that's not truly listening. It's like when you listen to music, the journey is the whole song. It's not like you don't listen to it so you can just get to the end of it. You know, people don't write music um, so they can get to the conclusion, right? The journey of the listening is in the whole thing. So in listening within the same thing when you listen within you're listening to the silence i'm listening to the silence and the idea that something would interrupt that silence like when i'm talking to myself in my head is part of the process of listening it's not really a distraction it's giving me a greater incentive to pay closer attention to the silence right if i see it as a distraction i'll get frustrated about it and then I've got another distraction, which is my frustration. Okay. If I see it as a prompt, if I see my inner self talking as a prompt to maintain a greater sense of vigilance for listening to the inner silence, I'll be grateful for it. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Focus, focus, focus. And it makes me focus more and more and more and more rather than get upset about things. It's like why... Uh, in uh, some countries like in India and that ashrams are built in quite noisy places rather than up in um, secluded places because it forces you to listen. It forces you to pay attention. If you've ever watched any of Dear One's uh, videos, Master Teacher's videos, he puts this rather annoying music. I think it's annoying. It's not my genre of music. It's uh, kind of old and like melodic and it's just like, what the hell is this music? but it forces me to pay attention. I have to block the music out to actually truly listen, right? which is the purpose of it. And uh, 
one of the things that um, when you're learning to study, like even in a school thing, when you're learning to study and you can't focus on the thing, you put the music on because the music distracts the part of your mind that would automatically be thinking about whatever else is going on and allows you to focus better. Okay. When you get into an automatic listening, so I'm automatically listening to the music, it's preoccupying that part of my mind that would ordinarily be want to be, which is why you put on music that you like and not music you don't like, which would ordinarily be um, trying to distract me from what I'm doing so I could do something that's more fun rather than study. Right? That part of the ego mind is always looking to co-opt every effort I make into uh, what's truly for my own greatest good because it's always demanding attention. It's like a little child. So when you have a distraction going on, you know, and like a little child, just exactly the same, you can distract them from their errant behavior by giving them something they enjoy, which at the same time will help them to focus on not only what they're enjoying, but um, listening to what you're trying to tell them. Right? If somebody's upset, they're hardly likely to want to listen. Right? Little kids especially, and we are little kids. In our mind, we are little kids. The ego is just this sort of tantrum-throwing kind of device that um, part of the mind that is always trying to strive to demonstrate its authenticity and its reality, and it doesn't have one. Right? But it's because I insist on believing in it and because I seem to um, be uh, beset by it on the physical plane, it's like you can't escape it, right? But you can train yourself not to listen to it. You can train yourself to listen to the silence. But to do that, you have to be willing to use that chit-chat, that internal chit-chat, as a prompt to focus more strongly, right? As well as the mind training, it all kind of works in together. Like last week, we did lesson 10. And uh, Tina said to me, what an incredible moment she had with doing that lesson. It brought her right back to a a, a place of uh, consolidation within her own mind where she could see things more clearly and all of that sort of thing. So you're utilizing all these different aspects of the mind training to bring you back to the here and the now, right? Where, where the listening is required, right? So in the particulars of uh, being confronted by something, when you're triggered by it, the last thing you want to do is listen, right? Now, because we're coming from a mind that is reactive rather than responsive, we're learning to um, see our triggers as prompts for healing rather than as opportunities for defense. Vivian, you've gone blank. Oh. So, and seen rightly, that's a good thing. Oh, there she is. Seen rightly, it's a good thing. Just get over my door here. It's the middle of winter. It's like, 30 degrees centigrade. There we go. But you can't avoid the dream, you know, like there's no point in trying to transcend what seems to be going on. You have to transform it. And that occurs in the mind, in the thinking part of the mind, where the thoughts seem to be. Okay, you have to address it where it seems to be. And to, about, to be able to address it, you have to let it in fully. You have to let in what's being said as if what's being said is true, but knowing that it has no reality whatsoever. All right. It's like if, it, if, a, if a Japanese person uh, stood in front of you in the street and started, you know, they were saying something, even though you didn't understand. Right. So out of courtesy, you would listen because there might be a word in there you understand, which will give you a clue to what the hell they're talking about. Right. It's the same with listening. Somebody who's, somebody who's expressing a problem or a, or a situation or a whatever it is, um, the, post, the posture is to listen. Because even though it may not make sense to you, even though you may not relate to it, there's going to be something, there's going to be one little keyword or something in there that triggers you, activates you, because nothing comes to you by accident. Nothing comes to you unrequested. Everything's a manifestation of your own mind. Keep your finger on your nose. And it's like, all right, my purpose in this is healing. If you forget that your purpose in this is healing, 
you're going to automatically defend yourself against what's going on or buy into it as if what's going on is true or has some aspect of your reality contained within the outcome of it. Does that make sense? All right. So truth is true and nothing else matters. Okay. Reality is what is true. Reality is eternal. Everything else is just a dream, the Maya, an illusion, a projection of my mind. I walk down the street, I see a friend, they start talking to me about something. That's not somebody else talking to me about something. That's my mind chit-chatting back to me, the same as if I was sitting by myself having mental mind chatter. But because I've projected out my mind out onto the world and given everything I see a meaning out there, someone's going to say something and I'm going to think that it's someone separate from me and that there's this choice I have where I either accept atonement for myself, hang on a minute, this is just me, this is just my mind being reflected back to me, or this is somebody else. Okay? Now, that takes mind training to hold yourself to that point. Right? That's a decision that I can make. And it's like, all right, we'll choose again. Let's choose again. I got it wrong. Let's choose again. And when you come home sometimes from being out in the world and doing whatever, you get back and you realize the opportunity you had to put your finger on your nose and you realize where it is you missed it. It's like, oh man, I had a conversation with Mrs. Jones down the road and this happened and that happened. And we had this whole chit chat for an hour, which just goes around in a circle. And I forgot the opportunity to put my finger on my nose and let the Holy Spirit in on the whole situation. Right? Now, a whole different outcome would have eventuated had I done that. But because I forgot to do that, that whole situation just goes around and around and around. And the next time I meet Mrs. Jones in the street, she's going to have a reference for me in her own mind, which is based on uh, the, the identity she got uh, prompted to think of me as in that last conversation. Does that make sense? So it's like, well, hang on, hang on a minute. I'm here to represent the Christ. Sounds like a big ask, but... That's what Jesus is asking me. I'm here, I'm here to represent God. So I meet Mrs. Jones in the street. She automatically starts talking about the weather or how I owe her $20 or whatever's going on there. And I'm going to put my finger on my nose and remind myself, this is a figure in my dream. My brother in Christ is not this body telling me all this stuff. My brother in Christ is a spirit the animating force of this body that I've given the instructions to play this part for me, right? Now, I'm just going to listen. I'm going to listen to Mrs. Jones tell me her whole thing because that's the script I've asked her to read from, okay, in my old script of denial. She doesn't know that I've picked up A Course in Miracles and I'm starting a new script. But somewhere at the very least, I can refuse to buy into the old script. And you'll see where it is, you know, like she'll ask you things like, don't you think so? You know, and all these sort of prompting questions to get you to join into her meaningless conversation that was part of the old script. In that moment, you get to make a choice. Father, what do I say? She's asked me a question or there's a situation here that seems to be um, lacking love, which can only ever be in me that I've projected out there, I need a miracle. I need something to happen in this interaction here to represent God, to show me that something else. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, become aware of the moment where I'm called upon for that if I'm not truly listening, if I'm not truly letting it in. If I'm defending myself or I'm waiting to say my bit, right, then I'm not truly listening. If I have an agenda in the situation, I'm not truly listening, right? My only agenda is God's agenda. And in that, there isn't really one because everything is just sort of left open, like the slate is left clean. There's no outcome that I prefer more than any other, other than what God would have it be, right? But if I defend myself, then I'm obviously assuming that uh, Mrs. Jones is a real thing. My brother is a body and so am I. And therefore, that whole moment is condemned to the dark. Okay. The opportunity to enlighten that situation gets missed and has to come all the way around again because the lesson repeats until it's learned. 
right? And everything is a lesson that God would have me learn. Everything. So it's like every encounter, no matter how profound or no matter how superficial, is an opportunity. But if I forget that I'm there to represent God, if I think I'm there to represent a Dave or a Tina or a Heidi or a Doug or a Vivian or a Anna, then I'm definitely going to miss the opportunity, right? Which is why it's important to set up your day properly from the start. Before your feet hit the floor, when you get out of bed, Father, today I want to have a day of peace. I want to have a day where I remember my purpose. I want to have a day where I um, listen properly. I want to have a day where I don't defend myself. I want That's the kind of day I want. Right? And then you just go from there. But if you don't, if you forget to set up your day properly and you don't do those like lessons in the day that remind you of what your purpose is, you're going to be walking absentmindedly down the street and you're going to have all these miscreative kind of things going on in your head, which will be seen out there in the world. And you'll be confronted by it and you'll get home and you'll feel lethargic and tired and exhausted because all you've done all day is judge everything. You know? And judgment is literally debilitating. It's like it just drags you down. Whew. That three and a half hour over the fence chat I had with Mrs. Jones, you know, it's like, man, that uh, that wore me out. That woman can just talk the ears off a donkey, you know, and like it's hard work listening. But if I'm listening with purpose, it's not hard work. Okay. I've never had to listen to anyone for three hours. I've, sometimes people will want to tell, you know, like when we have our things here, people will turn up and the new guys always have a story. Right? The new guys always want to tell you how bad their life has been and they're grateful for A Course in Miracles and everything else. And it doesn't matter what the particulars of the story. I've heard it a thousand times, but it's like I'm still listening for that one bit of the conversation that triggers me. I'm still listening for that one bit where the opening is. I'm not really listening so I can give them a solution or give them advice or give them whatever that may follow, but I'm listening for the place where um, my invitation to the Holy Spirit leaves a blank moment or, or brings about the opportunity for that blank moment to occur and something miraculous to happen other than the content continuation of that circular going nowhere, saying nothing kind of dead end conversation. Does that make sense? Which is what I didn't, what I didn't do this week. <laughs> I didn't listen and I defended myself. And the next thing you know, it's like, bam. What happened to my miracle mindedness? It's like make up a whole story about it and like the whole exactly, you know. But that's where it goes, you know. Seeing that that's where it goes is actually helpful. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do that again. I want to stay in peace. But seeing that I do that, right, or seeing that I did that gives me the prompt to be more vigilant, gives me the prompt to be more focused, to listen harder, to be more defenseless, all of this sort of stuff. Right? But sometimes it's a real kick in the guts, you know, it's like, oh, man. You, know, you get a little bit off track, you get a little bit off track, and the next thing you know, bam, you get brought back again. It's like, ooh, that hurt. But there's always the gratitude. If you don't have the gratitude, the gratitude is the the gratitude is the guarantee that you've learnt the lesson. Right? If you don't have the gratitude for what that situation has brought to you, it's going to have to come around again because the guarantee the guarantee of learning the lesson is being grateful for the person playing the part. Right? So, I've asked someone to play a part for me in my dream. Finger on my nose. I've asked someone to play a part for me in my dream. I'm never a victim. No one's saying anything or doing anything to me by accident, regardless how tragic and violent and horrible it might be. All right? Look at Jesus. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. You know, like nailed up on the cross. You can't get much worse than that. But he knew he's not a body. Forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. Love thy enemy. All right? There is no real enemy other than myself. I am my own enemy. I am my own worst 
um, advocate. Right? But I've asked you guys, whoever it is, whatever the situation, to present itself in my dream to help me wake up. Okay? Everything's showing up for that purpose. My ego is going to give it a different meaning. Oh, no, it's not showing up for salvation. That, that person's an asshole. That person's this, that, and the other. Well, how could that possibly happen in salvation? It's like, well, it happened. It got your attention. Now, process it. Do the work. Right? It's like, oh, I see. It's a mirror. It's showing me something about myself. It's giving me an opportunity to learn. Okay? Or to unlearn. Thanks for playing that part for me. Thanks for showing me that I still have uh, triggers, that I still have denial somewhere in me. It doesn't matter what the trigger is. The fact that there even is one is enough. Okay? If you can give it a name, give it a name, but that'll just help you to identify next time if it comes around again, you'll see that you weren't very honest in your prayer. But... It's just denial. It's truth or illusion, truth or illusion, truth or illusion. Right? So it shows up as an illusion. Somebody plays their part perfectly. It triggers me. It's up to me to bring that to truth. Right? I can't just walk around saying, oh, there is no world. There is no world. La, la, la. Everything's fine because that's just transcending everything. You know? That is the status quo. But if I'm confronted by something, it makes no sense to just fob it off. You have to be honest with yourself about where you find yourself. You know, your honesty about um, what's going on for you and your ego will become more and more cunning as you go. Your honesty about what's going on for you is how it is that you um, get into it, how it is that you do the work. Does that make sense? If I'm telling myself, oh, it doesn't matter, so-and-so is probably having a bad day. <laughs> I'm missing the whole point of the interaction. I'm okay. That person probably didn't mean it. We all have bad days. I won't worry about it. I'll just let it go. No, too late. You already bought into it. Too late. You already had a reaction. Now do the work. Don't be lazy. Right? Don't be lazy, Heidi. I don't know why I said that. Picking on Heidi. But, but the, whole, the whole confrontation should be prompt enough to activate that awareness. Hang on a minute. What's my purpose in this situation? Okay. The whole situation that's showing up should be prompt enough, right? Nothing shows up unless there's an opportunity. Nothing. God just doesn't put people in front of you for no reason. Just for shits and giggles. There's something to forgive. There's something to learn. You couldn't possibly be in a conversation with someone unless there was something in it for you to look at. Something in it for you to take responsibility for. Right? I am my brother's keeper and I am the dreamer of the dream. Does that make sense? Nothing happens by accident. No one shows up by accident. No one says anything, this, that, or the other by accident. There are no accidents. There's no coincidences and nothing by happen chance. Everything is perfectly orchestrated in a divine manner. But if I continue to ignore it, it'll build up and build up and build up and get worse and worse and worse every time that cycle comes around again until I have a heart attack or something. You've got to remember to laugh. You've got to practice forgiveness. You've got to release, release, release. Stay in that sort of whew, letting it go, letting it go. Here I am, Lord. So, but identifying it, identifying your own footprint in the conversation or your own, um, your own input in the conversation requires listening. Right? So that's listening externally. When you listen internally, obviously the only thing to listen to there is your silence. There's no point listening to your chit-chatty thoughts, even your spiritual ones. Because lesson 10 tells us that our thoughts don't mean anything, including all the thoughts of which we become aware during the practice period. Right? 
which are obviously going to be thoughts about a course in miracles and other spiritual things. Right? That's included in all the thoughts. Those thoughts are not the thoughts I think with God. They're the thoughts that tell me that, hey, you're not thinking the thoughts you think with God. What's going on? They're the thoughts that tell me that I have other thoughts that I do think with God. So listening internally, listening externally, listening is a whole posture of um, letting go of my agenda, letting go of my ideas about things and just including in everything. Right? I'm including in everything. I'm not separate from anything. I'm one with all things. This person having a whinge, that person telling me how fabulous everything is, this dog barking incessantly all night, some situation that I can't control. I'm not separate from any of it. I am the dreamer of my dream. It only exists as thoughts about it in my own mind. And that's where the release is. It only exists as my own thoughts about it in my own mind. Right? Look at this cup. How do I know that this cup will break or not if I drop it? Okay. My own thoughts about this cup are telling me what this cup is, that if it'll break or not when I drop it and what it's made of, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The cup itself can't tell me anything. That person out there can't tell me anything. It's only my thoughts about what I think they're saying that tells me anything. The fact that I think they're saying anything that has reality is my opportunity for healing. All of these words I'm saying now are nothing. But at least they're telling you that they're nothing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Imagine. Imagine another planet for a second, right? Visualize another planet in another dimension somewhere else and all your real family and friends are from that planet. They don't speak English. They don't speak English. They don't look anything like this, right? And they've sent you this book that's saying, hey, stop validating your planet and the language that you think you're uh, talking with on that because it's not, it's not your natural tongue, right? But the more you validate it and the more you buy into the drama and the story, you keep perpetuating it and uh, void the possibility of having the experience of being able to remember what your true tongue is and your true where you actually come from and what you really are. I'm telling you, this kingdom, your world, your kingdom is not of the, this world. You don't speak English or American, or whatever, or Australian, you don't speak that words, right? See where it is that you think that you've given a meaning to all those words and let it go. Forgive, 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 forgive. There's not a moment that God's voice doesn't call upon my forgiveness to save me. Not a moment. Ted used to say, try walking around just for one day, just for one whole day telling yourself repeatedly for the whole day, this is just a dream, this is just a dream, this is just a dream. You wouldn't react to any of it. Right? You wouldn't react to any of it. You'd just be like, it's like when you're watching television. I mean, my, I remember my grandparents used to, they used to watch cricket and whatever on the television and they'd shout at the TV as if the people on the TV could hear them. And granddad would sit there going, run, run, like that to the guys batting and they would have to run up and down, run up and down. He'd be like, run, as if they could hear. You know, it's like, that's a little nutty. But anyway, but that's exactly how it is. I say things on this computer. You guys think that you're hearing what I'm saying and, and all nod and like, yep, yep, yep. But it means nothing. It has no meaning other than that which I give it, which you give it, etc. I'm free. You're free. You don't have to react at all to anything in the dream. But to see where it is, it's like everything comes around, comes around, right? So your cycles repeat. Your lesson repeats until it's learned. You don't know what the last time you bought into something was. Right? 
It's like five years ago, I told someone to fuck off, you know, because they were in my face about something. It's like, that's going to come around again, right? I don't get out of this by telling the Holy Spirit to fuck off. <laughs> right? Because the Holy Spirit's presenting that opportunity. This is his curriculum I'm actually living in, not the one I believe I'm living in from my ego perspective, right? So all of a sudden, I've been doing a course in miracles for a couple of years. Along comes this fuck off situation again. I can't remember that situation from five years ago. And I'm like, where did this come from? It's that same lesson coming around again, right? Ten years ago, I did something that I felt guilty for. I didn't forgive myself for it at the time. Along comes a very similar situation, right, that I can reflect on and go, wow, this person's just like that person I met 10 years ago or, or whatever. Right? There's an opportunity. Nobody shows up without a purpose. No one shows up in your face you know, and presents you with a story unless there's an opportunity for forgiveness there. Just doesn't happen. There's no coincidences, no accidents, no mistakes. It's like, all right, I don't want to talk to this person because I remember five years ago, this person and I had a falling out, but now I've got a new purpose. Now let me listen. Here they are again. I can't avoid it. I don't want to avoid it. I don't want to have to wait another five years and go through this whole crap all over again. I'm just going to stand here defenselessly and let in what they're saying so I can take responsibility for it. So I can give it to the Holy Spirit. So I'm listening, listening, listening. All of a sudden, there's the thing I'm listening for. Bam, bam, bam. And I want to defend myself. It's like, now hang on a minute. Holy Spirit, take this. And you can feel that energetically wanting to come up and you want to say something. You want to have your two cents worth and tell them what you think. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that because that's going to perpetuate it. I don't know how to not do that, but I just don't want to do that. I want something else to occur other than that. Does that make sense, Anna? This whole course is about relationships, the whole thing relationships it's like let my words reflect mercy let me not defend myself against the figures in my dream let me just accept things exactly as they are knowing that they have no reality whatsoever <laughs> easy to say but in the moment where it's all showing up and everything seems to be topsy-turvy it's sometimes it's hard to do which is why the necessity for uh, being vigilant with your mind training is of the utmost importance. If I forget my purpose in any given situation, it's absolutely for certain I'm going to get the sharp end of the stick. <laughs> it's going to bite me in the ass, whatever sayings you have over there, I don't know. If I forget my purpose that I walk with God and go with God everywhere, then I'm going with my ego. My ego's only purpose is to give me grief, suffering, pain, death. That's what it's about. That's what it attempts to get me to verify over and over and over. I'm telling Jesus, no, I'm done with that. I want to walk with you now. I want to take your hand, walk with you, and that's all I want. But sometimes I forget and I let go of that hand. I got this now, Jesus. I got it. I understand. I know what forgiveness is about. I'm all good. Next thing you know, bam, something comes out of left field. It's funny. Welcome to the class for slow learners. I'll be your teacher for today, slow learner number one. <laughs> uh, there is a better way. You just got to work it. You know, it's like the 12 step program. Work the program till it works you. Mostly it works you, but when you do the work, when you look at the idea of confronting yourself for, uh, for your foibles, um, Often we don't go deep enough. We don't like to look at the really, really deep nitty gritty. We're just quite happy to sit on the surface and 
process what we think we can deal with. Sometimes it just shows up thick and fast and you wish it would stop. Anyway, I just thought that'd be good. I need to teach that so as I can you know, have it for myself. What's been happening with you, Heidi? You've got some ants in your pants there. A little bit of... I know, I always feel so antsy. Everyone's so still. <laughs> <laughs> Are you breathing? Are you are you breathing and just mm -hmm. like you know, grateful? Yeah, sometimes. Right. <laughs> so attitude of gratitude. You know? So you're included in salvation. What couldn't you be grateful for? It may not be much fun at times doing the work, but that's the work. That's how you know you're included. Your ability to actually do the work is the guarantee you're included in salvation. So, wow, thank God for that. I'm grateful. Therefore, you can be grateful to everyone and everything for whatever seems to be going on because everything's part of your salvation. I think that's what it is really, like what's been coming up in this whole meeting is that there's like just so much stuff happening kind of, out, it seems like outside of my world you know, that's been like confronted, you know, like friends getting a divorce, needing some, you know, needing attention, things happening, coming into my world and then being reminded like this is happening in my world, things in things at work, like just, I've, I feel like I've created myself in this little bubble and now I'm seeing like all this stuff has been happening, but what I'm being reminded of in this meeting is that it's me. Right. <laughs> and so I'm kind of, I think that's where my antsiness is coming from because it's really kind of firing. Um, oh, good. This whole, <laughs> this like, this whole week is kind of like, oh, shit. Right. Yeah, I can tell your energy is sort of like, <laughs> there's a sense of trepidation. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the finger on the nose gets you out of everything. Right. The finger on the the finger on the nose keeps it simple. Your friends are getting a divorce. Right. And it's so like I want to help. The, but huh? there's no like that. I guess that's where I get this. I got caught up. And even in I was still in this like right. this struggle because I'm like, I want to help. This is a mirror. I want to help. This is a mirror. Like <laughs> that doesn't mean you don't help, right? But you accept atonement for yourself first. Okay, let me accept atonement for myself first in this. Let me accept my own healing in this, right? There wouldn't be a healing if you weren't reacting to it, right? The fact that you react to it one way or the other or, or have a fear or a concern about anything other than perfect peace, right? You would have perfect peace if you 100% knew that in that moment you were there to represent God. When they were calling upon you for help or needing attention, whatever, I'm here to represent God. I'm not here to represent Heidi and Heidi's best ideas of what uh, paying attention, whatever can be. I'm here to represent God and let him speak, right? which will always produce the perfect outcome. Right? If you forget that, you're going to be antsy, right? but you accept atonement for yourself first. It's like, all right, I need healing first. I need to find that clear space in my mind where I can step back from this whole scenario own it, give it to God, and then wait for the answer. Wait for what's to come. Okay. It's like the Native American Indians, I forget which the tribe it is, but they have this beautiful thing. Um, I read this somewhere on like a, a not a fortune cookie, but something, <laughs> something cheesy like a fortune cookie. And, uh, you know, you know, you get those little books of wisdoms and things like that. They're just like little beginner's books and you open it up and it's got like affirmations and all these sort of useful bits and pieces. I think it was in one of those sort of books and it said that when you have a conversation with a Native American Indian, um, they don't answer you straight away. 
they sit and consider their answer, which is considered to be a sign of respect because they're communing with the spirit as to what they should say. Right? They're asking within, how should I answer my brother? How should I, what should I say? Whereas in our culture, we're kind of like, um, I got this. You're telling me this, that, and the other. I watched Dr. Phil yesterday. I know what to say, right? I don't need the Holy Spirit for this. I, I'm a fan of Oprah, or I've read A Course in Miracles. Right? But all that, all that A Course in Miracles is telling me is step back. Let God, let God handle it, right? Step back, ask and listen. Listen, learn and do, okay? There's nothing that goes on that is not an opportunity, that is not a part of my dream. Close your eyes for a second, Heidi. Take a breath. Imagine your world, your immediate world in the suburb where you live, in the city where you live, in the country where you live, and now part of a greater world with other countries, nations, and all of that sort of stuff. All of it's just going on in your own mind. The whole world just was there in your own mind, right there for that second. Now, when you open your eyes again, you actually believe you see it outside of you. You actually think it's somewhere else or it's over there. It's not. It's in your own mind. Look at that couple that are getting divorced. Where are they? They're an idea in your mind. They're not out there. There's no one down the road getting divorced from somebody else down the road. That's just the dream. That's just the illusion of um, a situation presented to me to try and convince me that there's a reality to the world I think I see around me. But there's not. Reality is eternal. That's the one standing foundation of all things that are real they're eternal everything else is a vast illusion the matrix vivian did you watch the matrix oh she did well done that's a little tick for you in the you know you get your chocolate so, everything keep your finger there heidi all right this is a divine romance your healing you're rekindling a romance with the universe. You had a lover's tiff for a second and you told God to fuck off. And now everything outside of you is going to reflect telling God to fuck off. These people are getting divorced. There's a war happening over there. And whatever you focus on, it's going to continue to show up for you. I can either focus on the lover's tiff that I had or accept that it's been healed, that everything's all okay now and we can just pick up where we left off right never having really left off at all you know when two people have an argument and then uh, later on uh, the person who's been doing all the blaming realizes they were wrong there was never actually anything that the other person did it's like that it's like you're standing there demanding that someone did something Later on down the track, you realize, oh, man, they didn't do it. It never actually happened. I made up a whole world of bullshit in my head about what I think I happened. I blamed that other person, made them feel bad, which in turn really made me feel bad because deep in my heart, I just want to love them and they love me. And now I have to forgive myself for that whole thing, right? It's simple to do or simple to say. Right? Now, put that on a cosmic scale. I had a lover's tiff with God, told God to fuck off because I thought God did something to me, which never occurred in reality. Tiny mad idea. Right? And I've been living in the effects of that belief ever since. Now it's given me to have the opportunity to heal that belief in me. But because the effects of that belief have been fragmentation, separation again and again and again and again, right? I wouldn't believe the idea of separation unless it was shared. I couldn't, but it's been shared, shared, shared. It's like when you break a pane of glass or a mirror in half, you've got two bits and then you break them again, you've got four and then you've got eight and, then, and it just goes on and on and on. And every time somebody's born into the world with another fragment of the whole, um, it gets more and more and more divided. 
right? But all of a sudden, I'm going to put my finger on my nose and go, hang on, no, there's no division. Everything is me. And I'm going to start that process of healing in my own mind of recognition that um, I was wrong. I was simply wrong about the whole thing. I had a lover's tiff. I blamed God for something which was actually my fault. I've exiled myself from my awareness of reality in doing that. I've realized I was wrong and now I'm repenting. Now I'm turning around, which is what repent means, to turn around. Instead of walking away from the light, I'm going to walk back into the light now. But I have to repair all those bridges I've burnt. I have to repair all those relationships where I thought someone did something to me and I blamed them, which are reflecting the nature of my relationship with God. Everything is going to show up on earth just as it is in heaven. I think someone did something to me in reality. I think God did something to me and kicked me out of reality, kicked me out of the Garden of, of Eden. And uh, actually, no, I kicked myself out of the Garden of Eden. But everything on earth shows me that I think I've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Someone's doing something to me. I'm a victim. Why is this happening to me? Rather than, oh, hang on a minute, finger on my nose, I'm doing this to me. I can heal this now. I can put my finger on my nose. I can look at these people that want to get divorced and whatever meaning I've given that idea or whatever it is I'm trying to defend myself against from having to be involved in that, anything. It's just a reflection of my relationship with the universe, with God. Everything is a reflection of my relationship with the whole. Either that or it's a reflection of my relationship in denial. Right? If I'm upset by it, obviously it's denial. But either one is useful because now I have a true purpose. Now my purpose is healing. Now my purpose is forgiveness. So any situation is useful to me. If I see my denial, that's great. I may not like it, but it's useful. I can heal. Right? If I see something that reflects my wholeness, Thank God for that. I can join with it gladly and celebrate that. Thank God. Here's another brother that is starting to remember, starting to wake up that we are one, that we are whole, and that we are responsible for our own thoughts about everything. Let me join with my holy brother, with my mighty companion on the road to truth, and bring with me all of those that I can that uh, may be going in the opposite direction. One of, the, one of the things that the Sufis have as a, as a, a statement of um, their, what would you call it? It's like in a religious order, where, you know, you have, the, you have a lay monk and then the monk and then uh, the abbot and all of that. So, and you get up in the ranks, you know, and you sort of become the preacher and all of that sort of thing. And uh, in the Sufi tradition, when you become a master, right, when you no longer require a teacher and all of that sort of thing, it's said that you're blameworthy, right? Now, to a Western person, if you said that you're blameworthy, they'd think that they were guilty of something and that you're accusing them of something. But in the Sufi traditions, to be blameworthy is to be able to take the world on your shoulders without being crushed by it. I'm willing to take the blame. If there's something to be blamed for, it's me because this is my dream, right? What do I care, right? I'm the one that believes in denial. There couldn't possibly be something to blame or someone to blame unless it was me that was projecting it out there. Therefore, I'm blameworthy. Rest it on my shoulders. I'll take it. I'll own it. I'll take responsibility for it and I'll sit in prayer until it's done. But literally, there's nothing, Heidi. There is nothing outside your own mind. There's two precepts that the whole course rests on. All spiritual work rests on. Time is not sequential. And there is nothing outside my own mind. Everything's happening here and now in me. That's it. Those two things will get you out of trouble no matter what and where. That's if your purpose truly is healing. If your purpose isn't truly healing, 
those two things are going to piss you off. It's going to be upsetting and troubling and like, God damn it. <laughs> but that's also useful. It's like, oh, I see, I don't want healing in this moment. I want to be right about something. I don't want to have to eat humble pie and admit that I was wrong. Well, obviously, obviously the reward isn't that important to you then. Obviously, there's still uh, more value for what's available to you in the world rather than God's promise. Choose again, my brother. Escape the wheel of reincarnation. Escape the realm of time and space or stay here and do it again and again because the lesson will repeat until it's learned and everything is a lesson being presented here and now. An opportunity to choose. I choose for my holiness by choosing for my brother's holiness and the holiness of all living things. I don't know how to make that choice, but I'm willing to. I don't know how to see those, that holiness, but I'm willing to see it. I'm asking to see it. I want an experience. Never take my finger off my nose. Never, never, never. When I do that, I let go of Jesus' hand. When I, let, when I do that, I forget my purpose. I am responsible. Everything I see, everything is just a part of my dream of separation, which I'm now healing through forgiveness. Is that clear? But we, that's why we're here. We're here for each other. You know? Doug sent me some beautiful... Uh, reminder in in my post i put up the other day and it's like i could totally hear him in that and it's like oh thank god i hear my brother i hear my brother there's like another little parcel of solace handed over you know like extended from doug's heart and i felt it and it's like oh man that's so nice but even if like i have some people <laughs> This is so funny. You have some guys that just kind of want to slap you awake. You know, like you get you get guys that are from the like the 12 step traditions that are just like really ruthless and they'll give you the most loving truth, but they'll brutalize you with it. It's just like, ah, it's like, you know, you're doing this to yourself. Don't be such an idiot. You know, these sorts of things. Wake up to yourself, you fool. <laughs> it's like, all right. I hear it. I hear that. That's love too. Yep. I get it. I get it. I hear what you're saying. I wish you had said it in a nicer way, but I hear what you're saying, you know, like, <laughs> but that's just how it is. You know, I'm grateful for everything. I'm grateful for everything. In the moment I forget my purpose, I lose my sense of gratitude. I lose my sense of orientation with taking responsibility for my dream, but the dream itself, will bring me back around to remembering to put my finger back on my nose. Okay. The effects of forgetting will be so obvious that my finger will go whoop, straight back onto my nose. All right, hang on a minute. I'm responsible for this. Every time I do that, my sense of self becomes stronger. My sense of inner peace, my abiding becomes more profound and deeper. You learn to remember better by forgetting. You look good, Anna. What's going on? Uh, a lot of stuff, actually. I don't cool. feel so <laughs> Lots of family issues. My whole body right. hurts today. Really? So, yeah. You look pretty good. You look very calm and relaxed and like like you're on holiday nearly. I could fall asleep. I'm so tired. Uh, <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> that's probably what it is. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, that's good. Why would I react at all to figures in a dream that I truly knew that I was dreaming? Why would I react at all 
the figures in a dream that I truly knew that I was dreaming. It's like, how can I truly know that I'm dreaming unless I have another reference? Jesus is telling me this is a dream, but compared to what? Yeah. Without an experience of reality, I've only got Jesus' word for that. It's like, well, that's probably good enough, actually. I mean, if you can't trust Jesus, who, you know. <laughs> I, can under, I can understand that you wouldn't trust me. I mean, you know, but, but Jesus, the head of the atonement, the one who resurrected, it's like, all right, it's either going to be a leap of faith or nothing at all. And that's where you want to be. That's, that's the exciting place. That's the precipice. Like you always want to be on the edge. That's the place where your awakening is. It's like use what's going on for you. Like look at your family thing. Look at your whole thing. Your body hurts. I mean, the body, the body gets beaten up by the mind that hurts itself. Right? The body suffers so that the mind will fail to see that it's the victim of its own thinking. Right? Now, if you can see that, you can actually be grateful for the recognition and begin to process what it is that's going on through the eyes of love rather than the eyes of self-condemnation or fear. It's like, all right, here's a relationship. It seems to be showing up. I'm judging it or whatever, or I'm reacting to it. And uh, as a result, I'm projecting that onto my body. I don't want to do that anymore. I want something else to happen, but not this. Okay. I want a different outcome to what I expect or what I think is going to occur in this situation, that event, whatever. But you have to ask. You have to ask. You've got to sit there in prayer in the raw sort of burning flesh kind of horrible moment and ask. And it's always better when you're right in the middle of it, like when you're right in the thick of all that emotionality, you're honest. You can deceive yourself with your thoughts, but you can't deceive yourself with your heart. You've got heartache and pain. It's like... There's nothing else but heartache and pain. You can't tell yourself you don't have heartache and pain. It's like, no, my emotions don't lie. I can try to manipulate my thinking to try and make it seem as if things aren't as bad as I'm telling myself they are. But it's like, how do I feel about it? I feel shit. I feel betrayed or I feel uh, whatever it is. You know, you don't even have to give it a name. You just feel it, right? What you feel is literally the fuel, the rocket fuel for your prayers. Let me sit in this feeling and pray. Let me use, because that those feelings are just energy, right? Let me use this energy rather than sit here dwelling on it and thinking about it and mulling it over in my head again and again and again, reading the course again. Let me use this energy for prayer. Help me, Father. Heal my mind. I need a miracle. And then don't decide what you think the miracle ought to look like. Right? Let it be miraculous. It's like I want, a, I want a miracle here. I just want a peaceful outcome to all these affairs. So this whole situation, whatever it is, I need a miracle. Right? You're entitled to miracles. Purification is necessary first but I think you're well on the road to purification. You're already seeing it. You're already processing stuff. You know, you're making space for the miracle. You would rather have peace than a grievance, right? That's all the purification there is. Right? Ask for the miracle. Ask for help. I need a miracle. Right? Use that heartfelt sort of angst and heart felt whatever it is it's like i'm tired of bottling this up because look what my body hurts and everything else aches i need something else other than this i need a miracle 
not a miracle to change that person's mind or a miracle to fix that other person or a miracle so that this or that doesn't happen or does happen, just a miracle. Don't define it. Don't tell God what his job is. Okay. God knows what you want before you even ask. <laughs> yeah, but God doesn't know the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. You know? Of course not. God only knows you as whole and perfect. But when you don't know yourself that way, it sends a signal. The Holy Spirit picks up on it. What's going on here? Oh, I see. There's a disconnection. Beep. We'll connect that back up. And then the love can flow again. It's like a telephone operator. You know those old telephone operator, operators and they put the plugs in the board and you want to talk to someone and they have to plug around and find the person? That's the Holy Spirit's job, not your job. I need to restore this connection. Which plug is it? Maybe if I plug it over there or maybe if I plug it over there. So let the Holy Spirit do it. Stop getting in the way. Step back. No one needs your dirty old two cents worth. Step back, get out of the way and let the miracle happen. You're learning to become miracle minded. Say it to me out loud, Anna. Miracle minded. Miracle minded. Miracle minded. Mir let, say it again. I am Come miracle on. minded. I'm learning. I, I am miracle. miracle minded. Right. Well, that'll do. Good. You have to kind of like, you know, get tough with yourself. The old habits to, to fall back into lament. You know, those old habits of falling back into the old ways of uh, going into a place where you feel down about your situation. It's like, hang on a minute. I've got to kick myself in the ass. I've got to kick myself in the butt, get myself out of the glooms, activate myself and be miracle minded about this. It doesn't do me any good to sit there dwelling on what might happen, could happen. Oh, my God, this is a terrible situation. That does nothing. It perpetuates more of a terrible situation. Right? The universe thinks, oh, look, this is what she wants. Uh, we'll give her more opportunities for that. Because <laughs> you're projecting it out there. And then you're like, how come I'm doing this course in miracles and nothing's changing? Because you're not doing a course in miracles. Right? You actually have to apply this. You actually have to apply it. Finger on my nose. I actually have to apply it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to hear that. Cool. Vivian, did you enjoy the Matrix? Yes, uh, because the version that I watched had uh, somebody... Uh, would stop it and say, this means this. That was really helpful. What? <laughs> what it's the hell good commentary. No, it's really good. It's the one I gave her. It's good commentary. Yeah. It's not yeah. like. No, um, it's not really good. It is really good. I mean, it's, it's helpful. Not, it's it's it helpful. not helpful. That's okay. not helpful. All right. You have me. to get you, helpful. Helpful is when you get the results of your own thinking. Mm. The whole reason I wanted you to watch that was so you could see yourself in it where you're at, not so someone else could explain to you what the movie's about and what the principles are. That was the whole purpose of watching it. If I tell you, let's go and watch the Truman Show, and then I sit there and I tell you, this is what Truman's doing now, and this is what it means according to spiritual blah, blah, blah. You're not working it out for yourself. You're not hearing it. You're just sitting back digesting something I'm telling you based on a vibration that I'm familiar with in myself and not 
resonating with it yourself. Right? Well, I did disagree with some of the <laughs> some of the commentary. <laughs> Good. The commentary seems to keep it all in the world, you know. And uh, you know, you just he woke up, but he only woke up into the world, you know. And right. I think that our awakening is going to be different than that. And we're not exactly. going to we're not going to create another world. We're going to right. see the real one. So, you here's, know? so here's here's the thing with the worlds, right? And this is just yeah. from me. I don't want to commentary like you're already you're already onto it, right? The thing with the worlds is this: there's the world of denial, right? Now the thing you have to the thing you have to understand is the separation occurred, let's say it occurred, right? It didn't actually occur, it only occurred in a dream, in a, in a possibility, right? But the, the, the separation occurred in eternity, right? Into the, into the mind of God where all things are one, blah, blah, tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh, into eternity, right? It occurred in eternity. Now, if you imagine eternity as another dimension, right? You got sucked out of that dimension into this one, where as pure spirit, you're drifting around in the planets, the stars and everything as spirit. And you're wondering what the hell's happened to me? Why is everything like this? What's going on? And then the angels and everybody else conspire together to make a habitable planet, put your spirit energy or, or mind into an amoeba, right? Which then evolves into a monkey into a person into a whatever right i'm just using a story here it's not particularly how it is but so that you can develop consciousness and look at your situation and begin to make choices that uh, will reverse the effect and cause of what you think has happened to you as a cause and effect relationship you think you have with god okay time's actually going backwards so what happens is the world was made as a forum for this experiment the physical world was made, right? Now you look out into the universe and you see all the other planets and things, they're all dead, dead as a doornail, all right? This one was specifically constructed, whether it be a computer program, whether it be um, a, what do they call that when they build an environment on a planet, geoforming, whether it's... Yeah something that some extraterrestrial race has put together and trees and seeds and been built over billions of years for this whole, doesn't really matter, right? But the physical world, the entirety of the physical realm doesn't exist, right? There is no world, Jesus is saying. He doesn't say there is no world in denial. He's saying there is no world. There's no cars, there's no trees, there's no shops, there's no uh, mountains there's no sun or moon where one day finishes and another day sun. there's none of that in reality right but we transition from our ignorant world into a world of understanding through an action of forgiveness from that world we awaken entirely from the dream of the physical domain into a more uh, formless version of life okay now for me i've already had a glimpse of what the next um, level, if you like, or the next dimensional version of that slightly less dense form of life is. Okay, I was met and instructed by some blue beings who were about eight foot tall and had lights in them. They were translucent and they had full of light that was just these light orbs, things in them. I can't explain it. But there's like, as just as the, the staircase goes down to the darkest, densest domain and dimension there is, which is the third dimension, so it also has to go back up again, gradually back up, okay? The journey from God back down into the dark, right? And I get to the bottom, I have my enlightenment or I reach a point of realisation where I make a new choice and I begin to go back again, right? I turn around, I repent, okay? I no longer go back through the bardo and come back for another reincarnation here because I've chosen to learn the lesson that I came here to learn, which is that I'm not separate from God. I am God's son and we are one. Now, that lesson is learned through the healing of relationships, through the action of forgiveness, 
So I can see the power of my mind in denial as well as in um, the collaborative venture of healing. I see things change. I see the miracle occur. Right? I become the witness to the truth in me and others also show up to, be, to bear witness to the truth in me as well. Right? That all occurs and all, all begins to happen by my willingness to become what, Anna? Miracle-minded. Miracle-minded. <laughs> Yay. I'm learning to become miracle-minded. I'm learning to remember my purpose in every situation that confronts me, in every opportunity that shows up for me. Every time my friends get a divorce, every time my boss says something, every time this happens, all these sorts of things, I'm learning to become miracle-minded. Yes, wow, and thank you, I'm responsible. Okay? Yes, wow, and thank you. Um, if I can't take responsibility and can't say that, then help. Okay? I need a miracle. But literally, I'm entitled to miracles. So what, what could possibly go wrong? Right. Of course, there's going to be those moments where I forget because the mind, ego mind, is of the forgetting. But if I can remember my purpose in those moments where I forget, I can remember that healing is my purpose. Forgiveness is my purpose. Happiness is my purpose. And I can be about the particulars of applying the principles to that situation to bring that about, which is miracle mindedness. I need to let the Holy Spirit sort this out. All my best efforts to sort it out are just going to end up with more problems. I need to let something in my higher mind, I'm only using like 5% down here in the conscious domain. I need to let something happen up here by stepping back and taking my hands off the wheel and my mind will automatically seek the light. That's its tendency. My mind's natural uh, capacity is communication, true communication. Okay. It's only when I try to control everything down here that I'm denying that. It's only when I'm sitting in fear that I deny that. And because I have free will, um, the power of my mind's going to, sit there we'll call it the holy spirit is going to sit back and go all right you do it you do it your way i'll be here when you need me <laughs> i'll just i'll just sit in the back and cruise along and watch the train wreck <laughs> it's like why didn't you help me lord look at the train wreck of my life why didn't you help me well you know i was here you could have asked for my help you have free will Learning to become miracle minded. Miracle minded. No, my question looks... was. Oh. My question was why didn't you help me the way I wanted? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. You I don't get this on your own terms. <laughs> no. You don't get salvation on your own terms. You don't go to a doctor because you're sick and then tell them the kind of prescription you want. You let them sort it out. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. You don't go to the Holy Spirit and say, oh, I've got this problem and I think this needs to happen and that needs to happen. It's like, no, the problem exists because you think this needs to happen and that needs to happen. That is the problem. You thinking something needs to happen is the problem. It's like, just butt out. <laughs> I tried it. <laughs> but out, out and let God sort it out. Yeah. I Nothing tried it though. And I hung on to way too oh. long. Oh yeah, you gotta try it. <laughs> yeah. Until you until you've given it a red hot shot, you're not gonna realize that it doesn't, you know. That's the old college try. <laughs> That's it, the old college try. I did it my way. <laughs> and it didn't work. <laughs> and it doesn't work. No, no it doesn't work it at all. It never does. <laughs> I'll convince myself that it works, though. I'm pretty good at convincing myself that I've got this. I do think it would do better. <laughs> 
You're being very quiet there, Tina. I think we need to. Oh, we've lost Anna. No. No, She's I'm going to sort out a family. Mm. Mm. Hopefully, with miracle mindedness. Mm. What are you doing? How's your avocado? Oh, you've lost a few leaves. No, no, it's got all the leaves. You see it? See how big it is? I can see it. Look at that. Yeah. I can't point. I was going to try and point to it in the screen, but you can point to it. Uh, let me see here. Have you seen Have you seen Twenty Eight Days with Sandra Bullock? You, yeah, that's the that's why you you told me that this this that was the that was live. the whole thing, wasn't it? Yeah, right. yeah, because that was dying. So, right, so, yeah, yeah. Heidi, have you seen Twenty Eight Days with Sandra Bullock? All right, Vivian, Heidi, Doug, Tina. I'm going to watch it again too. That'll be homework for the week. Twenty Eight Days with Sandra Bullock. What do you mean, yeah. bleh? I gotta watch it again. Yeah, watch it again. <laughs> that one, okay. You think you watched it before? Yeah, you gave me that before. That's the whole thing with the avocado. That's why the avocado. When did I give? When did I give you that before? When when we first started, you gave us all that assignment. I don't know if it was in this. The past. It was the class. It, what? In, in the, the past. In, in the past, I know. Okay. So I got to go back to the past and do it again. Okay. If there is only this moment, there is no past. You've never watched it before. Mm. Okay. You have a me you have a memory of having watched it before, but you can't ever convince me you've watched it before. I'm telling you, you've never watched it before. Right on. Right. Yes. Now, yes. if you watch it with that understanding, I've never watched this before, you'll see something new in it. Okay. I look forward to it. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing's ever presented that there isn't something for you to see in it, right? right. Yeah. It's like these lessons. You pick up this course, right? You actually believe that you read this course a year ago or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And you do those workbook lessons. You pick them up a year later and you do them again. You read them with a whole new diorama. They open up a whole new another thing. It's like, holy cow, I've read this lesson before and I never heard this. I yeah, never I'll got this out. Again then. Okay, because yeah, okay, okay. Because yeah. You it makes can, me not want to watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I so I need to watch it again. There's a reference in seemingly. What was that, mind. Heidi? What? I'm yeah, saying it's right. just amazing. I'm like, I don't know. Do I want to watch? <laughs> it's just like hearing people's reactions to it. I already like get my own idea. Like, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> right. Ready? Miracle minded. Uh, Be miracle minded. Just say yes. Wow. And thank you. Heidi, yes. Put yes. a finger up. Finger. Yes. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Now you'll see whether, whether that's true or not. Okay. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just stop with the middle one. Yes. Oh, I'll just do wow first. I'll just tell Dave wow. Like, yeah. Well, free guy. Wow's the artist. Tonight, so. <laughs> Yeah. Free so guy. 28, 28, 28 days. Oh, free guy. Yeah. Did you watch yeah, it? I, no, I have to watch it tonight. That's what I'm saying. That was good. Right. That was it? super good. Yeah. You know the you know the best scene in that whole Heidi, tell me the best scene in that whole film. Like the one that really slams it down, like slam dunk, home run. I, I like what pops in my head was like at the very end, like or in the end when they were like trying to jump over the bridge, like creating the bridge. And like, I, it, it's been a few months, so I don't remember like everything, but like the, the bad character that they created, like didn't have a heart. He wasn't complete yet. And when the right. other guy came to him, like he, he kind of completed his. Does that make sense? Like, didn't that happen? Yeah, that happened. That wasn't that wasn't the best. That wasn't the slam dunk though. Okay, well that was but, that's what popped in my head. The, it was like he wasn't. That was complete. that was good. That was yeah. good, but that wasn't that wasn't the moment. The the whole moment. I want when you watch it. I want you to watch this. Right, watch it again. So we've got twenty eight days and free oh. guy to watch. All right. You get to watch them both for the first time. 
right? <laughs> the scene in Free Guy is when he's falling apart and he goes to his friend who's the bank security guy, right? And the bank security guy didn't want to put the glasses on. Mm. Okay, he was afraid to put the glasses on. And he's, he's trying to tell his friend, the bank security guy, that they don't actually exist, that they're just programs in a freaking game, right? And the bank security guy says to him, you know what? I don't care if we just programs in the game. He said, I don't care if they're going to delete the game. You know how they were going to delete it? He goes, I don't care about all that. He goes, only this moment matters. Right now, we can love each other. Like, this is the moment we've got. How are we going to meet it? How are we going to join in this moment? It doesn't matter what tomorrow. It doesn't matter about what the reality or not reality. It doesn't matter. The world doesn't exist. All that matters is here and now. That's where love is. Yeah. The words he had, though, in that movie, they were just like priceless. That guy, I'd started crying. Like he's, he's, that actor was so really like, he carried that off so well. I'm like, oh, man, everything you want to think about it, absolutely every thought about that whole world, the, the, getting to the new world, building the bridge, everything, none of it matters. It doesn't matter whether they live happily after or don't live happily ever after. All that matters is now, is what they've got in that moment. That's it. Everything else is an idea of potential or future or tomorrow, not here and now. You know, like you totally nailed it. That was the moment. Slam dunk. That's a good one. <laughs> Home run. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Here and now. Here and now. God is here now in me. God is love. Here now in me. I can't feel God's love in me tomorrow. I can't feel it yesterday. I can't experience it down the track in another world, in another place, in another situation. It's always going to be here and now. And that's my choice. That's what I'm choosing for. Forgiveness just clears away the blocks so that what the here and the now is becomes so completely apparent and obvious to me that I'll begin to focus on it instead of focusing on all the grievances and the judgments and everything else that doesn't really mean anything. I'm going to let that whole world go and I'm going to enter into a forgiven world as a here and now perspective. I can't be in the forgiven world tomorrow. I can't be in a forgiven world in 12 months when I finish a course in miracles. A course in miracles will help me to realize that I can only be in that forgiven world, that state of mind now. <laughs> Everything else is a distraction. Everything else is an opportunity to forgive myself for thinking there's something other than that that I want. There's nothing I want other than love. Doesn't make sense, does it? Does it make sense to want something other than love? What's the point? You just die at the end of it. <laughs> you can have love whether you're living in a palace or whether you're living under a sheet of tin. Doesn't require money. It doesn't require tomorrow. It doesn't require hard work. It doesn't require anything. It just requires willingness. All I need is the willingness to see my interests and my brother's interests as not separate. I'm one with all things here and now. The love we share is always present. It's only me that obliterates it from my awareness by thinking that it takes time to come to some realization of that. But healing is the work that's important. Healing is the healing is literally the the undoing of what never was that seems to be um, keeping me focused on listening to Dave. Seems to be keeping me focused on 
listening to the news, listening to things that have no meaning other than that there's going to be an opening there somewhere for me to realise something, realise what's important. This person that's in my face, blah, 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 blah. They seem to be angry. They seem to be this and that, all these meanings I've given them. Right? But here and now is where the love is. This is presenting me an opp opportunity to heal all that other stuff. And the greater the conflict, the, the greater the emotionality of it, the, the more profound the opportunity for, for the miracle is going to be. The, the more honest I'm going to be, the greater the depth of um, falling into surrender is going to be. So you watch that movie, you watch uh, 28 Days, you know, and it's like there's a moment there where um, her temptations, which are represented in the movie by her boyfriend, right, her temptations keep showing up again and again and again to tempt her back into the old ways, okay? Finally, she stops looking at herself in the mirror, you know, what she's so important and everything, and starts to see what everybody else is going through in rehab. She starts to realise that there are true friendships and that people do care about her um, more than what they can get out of her body or her, the prestige of having a glamour woman in her car and all this thing that her boyfriend was using her for trophy girlfriend or whatever, you know, she starts to see herself through their eyes. Other guys in rehab and she starts to see them through her eyes until finally her temptations show up again. And she's like, no, nah, I'm choosing for this. And the temptation becomes insistent. Come on. You can't be serious. These people are all losers. They're not like us. We're popular. We're, we're in the jet set. We're, we're this, we're that. We're not like those bunch of losers. And she makes the choice that her interests are the same as those other people. You know? And she learns to find the moment. She learns to find love, self-love. She learns to love herself for who she is rather than for how it is that she's validated for her body and her looks and her, and her wit and her whatever. Because she's fun to get drunk with. All of this sort of stuff. That's, that moment is every moment. That moment is, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. So even if you represent my temptation, I love you. I'm not going to buy into the temptation. I'm not going to validate it. doesn't mean I don't love you. No. Her saying no to her boyfriend didn't mean she didn't, long, no, didn't any longer love, not love her boyfriend. It just meant that she was aware that something else had to occur in order for the love she had for her boyfriend to be a similar love to what she had for everybody else. It wasn't a special love. It wasn't something that was fulfilling her. Rather, than she was fulfilled from within. You know? Incredible movie. The whole thing's an incredible transformation. Same thing with Free Guy. So that's homework. <laughs> it's better homework than when you're in school and they make you do 10 pages of Pythagoras' theorem and shit like that. And it's like... I'm sure if you had a mathematical brain, you could find salvation in that too, but I don't. I don't. <laughs> oh, you, yeah, Vivian, you do. You, you, you could probably. You could, I got that for right. three pages. <laughs> right. You could probably, you could probably study Stephen Hawking's theory of string theory and stuff, and you'd find salvation there. I look at it and I go ping pong tomato, you know, like I don't get it. It's just like whatever. <laughs> But that's like it just like horses for courses, you know. There's there's no moment that salvation's not available to you, regardless of where it is you find yourself associating with, you know, create creatively, academically, whatever. But you got to bring those two things together, you know, like left brain, right brain. It's like there's no real left brain or right brain. You, it's it's a whole thing. It's like stop thinking of it as a brain and thinking of it as a self. You know, the yin and the yang are both me. I'm not just all yin and I'm not just all yang. I'm both things together. I bring both of those 
every idea has an opposite. Day has a night, tomorrow has a yesterday, right has a wrong. I can't have one without the other. I include them both in, I include it all in because that's my world, good and bad, right and wrong. I don't want to be right about something and I don't want to be wrong about something. I'm just going to let it be miraculous. I'm going to learn to live in the now rather than in time, defenselessly. See myself how God sees me, innocent. Like Sandra Bullock in 28 Days. <laughs> she begins to see herself differently. She has a moment. She has a holy instant there. All of a sudden, there's a little change, a transformation. It's a beautiful move. What's happening in your world, Doug? You look very relaxed there. That chair looks massive, like a big Papa Sun chair. <laughs> um, everything is good. I, I am enjoying tonight's meeting. And uh, I think that the course and these meetings are helping with being miracle minded and having that become just an onward way of, of being. Yes. Uh, so there are times where, you know, time disappears and I'm just extremely <laughs> overwhelmed with the present and, you know, all the possibilities and it, it either feels like, you know, a million years are going by or just a, a split second. And, and those are lovely transcendent uh, experiences. Uh, so I know that I deserve uh, miracles. And, um, and I think the proof is that there are, that I am noticing miracles occurring and I notice trying to grab onto them to make them work <laughs> you know to you know, the old famous oh, I'm gonna make this miracle work out you know and I just notice it and it that thought you know slip yeah that thought slips through my hands which is really fun to watch you know oh yeah. Miracle, there's something I want. I know it's coming. Grab hold of it. You know, it all happens so quickly, and I just feel it slipping through my hands, and that feels so nice, you know, like desperately. And then to notice the desperation, and then to kind of smile and just watch it all float away. <laughs> so that's been fun. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what's going on. Cool. That's good. It's good. It's good to watch your thoughts. It's good to see where they're going. You know, like you have to be aware of what you're doing in your own mind so you can make the correction. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not even aware of it, like, you know, you're behind the eight ball. It's like, what can you do? Nothing really. So, but that's the whole point of mind training. You know, the whole mind training is to get you to become aware of what you're actually doing in your mind. Right. Oh, look at that. Look at all that judgment I've got going on there. Look at that whole story I made about that whole thing. What's, what's fun now is that I've got a laugh, a, a laugh that's associated with it now, which is really oh, good. good. That's so, it. That's the thing. That's the secret laugh. <laughs> so I'll have a thought and then automatically there'll be a laugh attached to it. And I go, whoo, you know, thank right. God the laugh was there. And then it just kind of disappears with the laugh. Right. That's it. That's exactly it. Right, Somebody, that, oh, it was Anthea. Anthea. Anthea asked me during the week, she goes, what is that with that laugh you do? How come you're always laughing? It's like, I'm just letting go of my thoughts. Like things are just processing right. automatically and you just laugh them away. There's like a little moment of, or, you know, you're you're right. Right. Ted used to talk about it as as the the club, you know. You got it's the laugh club, and you 
you get that luck. You can't force it. It just starts to happen, you know, and you, you get right. that laugh and you're laughing at yourself. You're letting it go and it's just automatic. Yes. You know, it's like we used to have uh, in that, in that healing center, there would be like a hundred chairs sometimes, you know, and people would be, it'd be packed. When I first started going there, when Ted used to go to uh, back to Wisconsin for a while and, uh, and then he'd come back, right? Because he'd been away for a while, everyone would leave, right? He was the head teacher and the whole thing. And when he wasn't there, all the guys that weren't really devoted would just go out and do stuff, whatever. They didn't really hear the whole stay together, keep practicing, do the whole, you know, they weren't really in it. Mm. And uh, when Ted would come back, they'd come back as if they'd been through a hurricane, right? They'd be out there in the world and be, and be like, oh, thank God you're back. Oh. I, I've been through hell while you're away. But all the guys that stayed in it, they didn't have to go through that hell. They had each other. They had their mighty companions there together and they were processing their stuff together and all had the secret laugh and doing everything together because yes. this whole thing is about collaboration and union and joining. Yes. And... Uh, Ted used to talk about it as, as the secret laugh club. And after he, after he gave, like he was talking in session one day about that laugh, right? How you just laugh your thoughts away. After he said that, a whole bunch of the guys that used to hang around the periphery just started trying to laugh as if that was the thing to do. But it's, you know, but it's automatic. It's like, you know what an NPC is? Non-player character, right? In yeah. a video game. Yeah. All these guys were like non-player characters. They would just <laughs> hang around, hang around. And then there was like a core. There was like a core of guys that were there all the time. They would always turn up. And they were the ones that would get the the um, the full value, right? Yeah. The full value of it. It's like everyone else was like a train wreck, going back out into their worldly shit. And then when they've had too much, coming back like a drug addict, you know? It's like come back for rehab, come back for rehab. And they just keep coming back but they never complete the rehab. They just come back there because they suddenly feel good, you know, for yeah. a minute. And then I'm good now and I can, I can just moderate my usage. It's like, no, you can't, you're an addict. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was that laugh and it was really funny because um, when we did our light sessions, all the guys that were really in it would be laughing and having this thing going on. And you could see other guys. I used to do the music, right? So I'd, I'd stand over in the corner in the, like the little DJ box and I'd be playing the music and I'd see all these guys that were just not really, I knew who they were, you know, I knew who the core was. And I'd see all these guys and they're standing there with their hands in the air and they're looking around like everybody else is laughing. And so they just start laughing. <laughs> like that's something like those Indian laugh schools as if that was it. You know, it's like, that's not it. It's like the laughter, the laughter is the release. The laughter is the joy of both the recognition I've been mistaken yeah. and the correction of the error by the Holy Spirit. The sound of heaven is the laughter of little children. You cannot uh, not laugh, right? You cannot not laugh. Initially, what happens is you tend to cry a lot. <laughs> right. right? Well, I, uh, when, the, when the processing, when you when you start on your processing, you tend to yeah. you tend to get very shattered by it, and you start crying, and you yeah. and you feel bad, and you release stuff through crying. Yes. As you become less fearful of making the confrontation, the Holy Spirit picks up on that and starts to release more and more in you, which like it's like a sexual arousal almost. It's like something happens inside, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's tickling your G spot or your giggle spot, G for yeah. giggle, not G for pleasure, tickling your giggle spot and you start to giggle and you start to laugh instead of cry. And you'll find that you're, that you're crying, crying, crying. And then you just start laughing and you're going, well, hang on a minute. I was, just, I was crying and really like miserable a second ago. And now I'm laughing. What's going on? There's like this transition, yes. but you've got to stop being fearful of getting the healing. You've got to stop being fearful of allowing the Holy spirit to do what activity it needs to do in you. Yes. Like, and yes, that, that takes a moment. That takes a moment. Like you can, you can sit there, and it's like you've got to be willing to change. This is one of the, this is yeah. one of the prime things. I don't talk about this much, but as your transformation proceeds, 
you have to be willing to proceed with it, to change with it, right? Your particulars in relationship with the atonement are going to change, right? Mind training isn't going to be your function forever. Mind training and forgiveness aren't going to be your function forever. They're going to be bedfellows. You're always going to be with them, but they're not going to be the prime focus of the inner work forever. Yes. Eventually what happens is you apply it, apply it, apply it, and it just starts to work automatically. Yes. And then you can kind of go on to other stuff, right? Yes. The other stuff being more of um, more like an apostleship rather than a discipleship. You can start to help others more than realizing that first I need to help myself, right? You can start to extend the light of what it is that you've integrated and learned so far um, rather than just focusing on what you need to do for yourself first. But first, you do have to do it for yourself first, right? And then when, it, when you go through these shifts, you got to let yourself go through those shifts and you yes. got to let yourself be okay with going through those shifts and going through the changes because the Holy Spirit's trying to get you to um, a point of full awakening, not just a point of um, sitting in mind training forever. Right. You know, and it's, and it's easy to be grateful for the mind. Oh, thank God I've found this. This is representing the truth. It's representing the truth, but it's not the truth in itself. Yes. You know, so you've got to get to this point where, um, oh, I see I'm starting to laugh now as the release mechanism. That's cool. That's good. That's how it's always going to be because the sound of eternity is laughter. Right? Yes. The, sound of, the sound of heaven, right? Your laughter is part and parcel of the activity of the Holy Spirit in you or the spirit of wholeness in you, but you've got to let that be okay um, rather than continuing to, um, not really rather than, other than um, continuing to think that healing is validated, uh, subconsciously validated when you're crying. Oh, I'm healing. I'm crying. I'm releasing emotional stuff. It's like, yeah, but you don't have to continue to release it through tears. You can yes. be happy about it. You know, it's like, give it to the Holy Spirit fully. It's yes. like, all right, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready for a shift. I want to laugh my ass off. Right. I want to laugh my head off. I want to laugh at everything. I want to laugh at the whole dream I made. <laughs> and, and then in some way, too, it feels like that. And I think you've said this in other ways that a person has to do it in their own time, according yeah. to their way of doing it. And I think right. me putting myself usually though it has a sheet on it now in this chair and doing that work of cleansing the system by letting the you know facing the fears and uh meeting them head on and you know that journey into fear right. you know I've done that many times now and it feels like that part is kind of worked itself in some through i mean still when i say i like it what i mean is i like the freedom it gives me when i'm done whatever that means done with it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh and i haven't really i get to uh you folks today reminds me that i really haven't done it too much lately i haven't put myself in this chair to go to the depths of fear and sadness and anger um and i it's, it's very valuable uh, uh but it feels like like uh, now i am getting ready to branch out to help others it feels like i've done enough work that holy spirit is saying okay you, you know you're in on it now we, you know we, we've given you some relief you've right. you've got the You've got the humor. You've got the joke behind it now, and now it's okay oh, for you to exactly. break out and help others. Yeah, yeah. You you have to get the joke behind it. The whole yeah. thing's a divine. It's all I, a cosmic I, joke. <laughs> well, I was waiting to get. The, I mean, and I I over the years I've gotten the joke, but I was really waiting to get this one. Like this one, I really needed to get the joke, and and right. now it's you know occasionally it's given to me. You know, a giggle you know, three or four times a day. It's just all of a sudden, boom, it pops out. And I go, oh, thank God I giggled. Yeah. You know, and then I keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I really, I really wanted to get this joke. I really did. All right, so ready? I, I, wanted to, I want to tell you something about what you were saying then. 
So you were saying everybody has to learn it at their own pace, and that's true, right? But don't decide what your own pace is. Okay. Okay? Because God knows better what you're ready for than you do. If it was left up to you, you'd, you'd drag your feet and dawdle along all day long. Oh, you know Cause it. That, right, because at that pace, you don't have to confront too much. But Jesus is saying, come on, man, the, the clock's ticking. The world's yeah. old and tired and without hope. And you got you got to like do this work and get it done. So it's yes. like, if I'm being miracle-minded, I can speed this up. I can put my learning on the fast track and really go for it. Right. In that, my idea of learning at my own pace really doesn't have a meaning. Right. I'm learning at miracle pace. Okay. <laughs> I can wow. learn if I want to ready. The, the central lesson is that there is no world. I can learn that right now if I want to. Yes. Jesus, Jesus can show me that and I can learn that lesson right now if I want to. Wow. Okay. That doesn't require a pace. It just requires me to say, yes, Lord, I want to know. I want to, I want to learn that lesson. Right? Oh. And being willing to undergo the guidance of the Holy Spirit to, to bring that about, the ability to learn that lesson. There may need to be some kind of orchestration. Right. Like for me, for me, when I was when I had to learn that lesson, I didn't even know I was going to learn that there is no world. Right. I, I was in the dark night of my soul and I was praying like no tomorrow because I was going to slip my wrists and the whole thing, I was, I was done, you know, and I was praying. I didn't want to slip my wrists, but I was praying, praying, praying. There was an orchestration that took place over the next three days to get me to Byron Bay to the miracle center that I didn't even know existed, right, to get me to that place and to get me into that little group of people who were reading the 20-minute book aloud like we do here so that when the experience of there is no world occurred, I would relate it with what was going on there and realize that I had to be in an association with what was going on there to help purify my mind and ground the experience. Otherwise, I would have ended up batshit crazy. Right? If you're shown that there is no world and just left to your own devices, man, you'll just go around the twist. That's why purification is necessary first. You go to the old school nut houses or asylums and whatever, and they're full of people. I've seen God. I've walked with Jesus, or I am Jesus, you know, and think people, they've had bona fide experiences, non temporal, transcendental experiences. I believe all of those guys, right? All the guys that walk around going, we have a guy in Australia, he's passed on now, but we had a guy in Australia, I forget his name. I think people just call him the Eternity Man. He had an experience. His story is probably on his his story is probably on the internet. He had an experience of direct union with God. He went back to eternity. He had a, a profound thing. This is before the course came. And it fried his circuits. It totally fried his circuits. Right? He couldn't relate to the whole thing. All he knew that was he was in eternity one minute and then he was back in the world the next. For the rest of his life. He would get welfare money, but for the rest of his life, he would buy chalk, like for writing on a blackboard, and he would just go walk around Sydney writing in beautiful handwriting, eternity, everywhere, on sidewalks, on walls, on trees, on people's fences. You could you couldn't not walk around Sydney and not see eternity written all over the place. Oh wow. That was his um that was his thing he did that for something like 36 years or something all day every day I've, I've been to sydney twice and i think i've seen like both times i've been there, i think i've seen eternity way back then like he's passed now but way back then eternity i must have seen it at least half a dozen times during the course of a day yeah. written on bridges and doors and old factories and fences and just the guy just walks around writing eternity on everything but that was how he kept that experience of eternity fresh in his own mind rather than allowing the ego to corrupt it. Yes. You know? That was his kind of mind training, I guess, you know, like it was something that he knew he had to do. He had to express from that experience. And that was the only way he knew how to do it. Whether or not you could have actually had a proper conversation or um, whatever, or talk to him about anything, I don't really know, but I know other guys that have had experiences of, 
transcendental moments in their own mind and you can't talk to them about anything. It's like they've had a major overdose on psychotropic drugs and they have never recovered. Yeah. You know? Which is why mind training is essential because your ego will take the energy of that experience and try to use it for its own purposes. Right? And you won't even realize that that's happening. Mm-hmm. You'll be like, wow, I had an experience. I'm great. I'm all good now. Thanks very much. And your ego will automatically, it's like filling up your tank with on your car with like the best petrol. But but even more so, your car runs much better. Everything runs much better. You, you have more lucidity. You can just deal with everything. Like everything's totally perfect in your own mind. But in a world that represents your old denial, your old script of denial of imperfection, all of a sudden you don't really fit in and the world doesn't know what to do with you. You've got to lock this guy away for his own good. He's crazy. He thinks he's Jesus. (laughs) That's what happens. It's like, I know he's Jesus. I know the guy that says he's Jesus is Jesus. He's not talking Jesus, literally the, the figurative person. He's talking the Christ. We used to have a guy in Byron Bay that um, he was a young fella. And uh, I used to be like the church warden there for a while. And so at night we had this big gate and a padlock and whatever. There was all sorts of things would go on at night, parties and whatever. And we had the cabins out the back. And because it was sort of like a church and big open ground, people would just shortcut through and uh, wake everybody up and yelling and screaming and sit in the lunch area under the fig tree and drink alcohol and whatever. So I would lock the fence lock the gate and they'd have to go around you know the long way around and uh, we had this one young guy that knew I locked the gate at 10 o'clock and he would turn up at about 15 minutes to 10 (laughs) and he would stand out in the courtyard under the fig tree with his hands in the air and pontificate the the the, um, teachings of Jesus and whatever sometimes he'd get them wrong and whatever and he'd be whatever and uh, all the lights would come on in the cabins, which was mostly women. And um, the cabins were kind of like, um, what do they call that? When you are when you have domestic abuse and stuff. So we would have some women that had had a hard life and they'd be, it was kind of a, 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 a safe place, you know. But um, he would turn up and we'd always have to call the police, you know, like the police would be very gentle with him because... That something had happened in his mind and Christopher and Adele and me and whatever, we'd all be there and just keeping him calm and the whole thing like this. But I would talk to him and try to tell him that, brother, you're standing in a place where people are consciously attempting to integrate the teachings of Christ on a daily basis to use in their own thing. And he would say, well, why don't you want to listen to me? Because that's what I'm teaching. Oh, wow. Okay? That's what I'm teaching. Why don't you want to listen to me? I am the Christ. That was his thing. And it's like, well, because it's like nearly 10 o'clock at night, everyone's going to sleep, you know, and it's like, but he knew, he knew that if he turned up during the day, Ted was the head teacher there. He wouldn't be able to stand with his hands in the air and teach because Ted wouldn't have it. Right. You're there for the purpose that the place is set up as not to run your own show. But the, the, part of the, the part of the thing that he was missing was um, acceptance. He was trying to force it upon everybody rather than um, accepting that he was actually in a place where nobody wanted to hear from him. Yeah. Right? Other than out of politeness and kindness until the police arrived. Oh, and they would, take him off, they would take him off to the home, you know, and he'd, he'd be there for a while. But... Um, he wasn't willing to enter into mind training that would help him to facilitate the integration of all of the principles that he would need to, to ground that experience. He had that experience. He knew what he had to do and he wanted to do it come hell or high water, regardless of what anybody said to him. Even when the police tried to move him on, he would stand there rather than just say, yes, brother, thank you. Yes. Wow. And thank you. If my brother asks, then I'll just say, yes rather than just say yes to them, he would make up some story how he's the Christ and he's entitled to be there and whatever and create a big scene, right? Now, that's the fact of the matter. But if he was to learn to listen to specific guidance, he'd be guided where he can be useful. He wouldn't be continually into conflict with the police or uh, being kicked out of places. You know what I mean? It's like there's there's an inner guidance that 
where you have something to express and to help others, you'll be guided how to do that very specifically, right? Yeah. Yes. His, his thinking was, I'll go where people want to learn about Jesus and I'll teach them. And it's like, well, hang on, they're already learning about Jesus from a teacher that they've chosen to be with, not right. from you. You can't, you can't force yourself upon it. So Right. And so the point is that he did have a lot of insight, but he was using yeah. it in an egotistical fashion. That's right. His ego had corrupted it because he didn't right. have the mind training. Right. Right. And, and he was he, he was like away with the fair. It was the same for me, exactly the same for me. Yeah. Right. If I hadn't had all those guys in Byron Bay around me to support me after my awakening, I would have been running through the streets naked, like yelling, yelling hallelujah. Like it was the, the experience was so powerful, so liberating. You don't want to wear clothes. You don't want to be in your body. You don't want anything. You know the truth and that's all you want to represent. You know, it's like I would have ended up in the nut house. It took me a long time. It took me, oh, God, probably. And it's still taking me like <laughs> after this week's shenanigans, you know, like it's still taking me all this time to, to, to hear it and to integrate it. Like it's an ongoing process until right. the end of time, until, until, I'm done, you know. Although so there's, although there's not a specific formula for it, I do have to say that the light circles, and then taking time every day to meditate, and the mind training, those three things, I think, really take effect after a while. Right. Yeah. I think they really begin to harness this in a way where it it appears it automatically like Holy Spirit is automatically on your side. I I'm just using my own words, but I think yeah. you get the idea. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. But you get to that, but you gotta ask, you know. It's like you don't want to be at the same I don't know if the idea well, of level is uh, is accurate, but you don't want to be at the same level with this all the way through. You know, it's like, all right, I'm ready to step up. I want more. Yeah, you got to yeah. ask. I want more. Now that's yeah. going to require the letting go of the old and the embracing of the new, and perhaps some confrontation and whatever. But it's like you managed it before. Let's do it again. Yeah, Let's I, keep going. I think that's mm -hmm. next, and what you're saying it really resonates with me right now. Yes, to bring on the next the next part right. of it and not get stuck right. not get stuck in this this phase and don't expect it to look like what it's been looking like so far you know let it let it be uh, if it's going to look like something completely different let it look like something completely different when you go into your meditation and your prayer and everything else don't sit there in the same posture of mind expecting the same sort of results just like all right holy spirit i want more i don't know what that's going to look like I'm no, I, exactly. Right? Oh, yeah. No, you're preaching to the but choir. Just, just always remember the entirety of salvation is held out to you now. All right. The, enti the entirety. You may be only willing to accept a small bit of it or a bit of it, but it doesn't mean that you're not capable of accepting the whole lot of it. All right. Right. So it's like Jesus says, it's not that you guys don't ask for stuff. It's just you don't ask for enough. You're entitled to miracles. You're entitled to everything. Ask for everything. Ask for your full release from time and space. Ask for that. That's already been given to you somewhere in your mind. It's like, it's not like you're asking for something you don't already have. It's like, oh, hang on a minute. The resurrection is already complete in me. It's already done. It's already complete. Let me realize that in its entirety. You know, you can take you can take it a bit at a time if you want to. Your, your awakening will keep pace with you, but you need to become aware that you don't have to do it that way. I'm listening you can to jump you. on the you can jump on the fast track, and Jesus will take you right to the end and show you the whole bloody shebang, <laughs> the whole nine yards. But that's a that, 
that's a big ask. You know, it's like, that's a big ask. It's like, you got to be done. You got to be ready for it. You got to be, you got to be like, yeah, I'm done with the world. I'm fucking sick of this. Yeah. I'm so over all this. You know, it's like every, that's where Jesus says, you really need to see that all the avenues of the world are all alike. They all end in death. It's like in the matrix where he opens the door and goes, let me out of here. And she says to him, you know where that road leads. You've been down there before. Right? That's every road. That's every pathway, every opportunity in the world, everything that you think is going to bring you happiness in the world. So, Heidi, take the hand of the Mar Mary, the mother of Christ. Take that hand. It's going to be held out to you very soon. I know it is. I just saw it right in my mind. There's going to be something comes along, some offering, and it's going to be the Mother Mary for you. Take it. Just say yes. Just take it. You have that energy. You have the energy of, of the mother. Like it's deep. It's deep in your psyche. It's like there's a vibration there that you'll resonate with in a way that, man, it'll just open up stuff. It's a role. It's a role. It's a, it's a, it's a script. It's a story that for a second we step into that story to bring ourselves to an advancement that without that story might have taken us a lot longer to get to. It's like mighty companions. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's do a circle. You guys keen? I haven't had sure. breakfast yet. It's like it's like <laughs> like two thirty in the afternoon here. <laughs> I had a handful of prunes for breakfast, and I'm I'm feeling them already. So I'm not going to run off just yet, though. And a and a hot chocolate. So, but I'm starting to feel a little bit of um. You know, my mind's telling me that my body is hungry. So. I have pudding in the fridge. I'm having, is that terrible, Tina? <laughs> I have chocolate mousse and one of those, um, one of those, what are they called? The upside down pudding with the caramel and it droops all down it. It's like custard. I have one of those. That's lunch. I had that for dinner last night too. I had chocolate pudding and thing. Prunes for breakfast. All right, breathe. 